my pleasure to introduce Dave Bly. He's a professor of statistics and computer science at Columbia University. Um, he's well known for, uh, for his pioneering work on topic modeling. So I think the, um, the original paper on um, latent Dirichlet allocation had, uh, had so many citations that it was almost single-handedly propping up the impact factor of the Journal of uh, Machine Learning Research uh, for many years. Um, and it, it's been, which has been, since been applied to an amazing variety of, of different number of fields in text, images, um, audio, and so on. And um, he's, uh, and David has received a, a number of awards for his research, including a Sloan Fellowship um, a, uh, and the ACM Prize in Computing. And he's a fellow of the ACM, and he's going to talk about probabilistic topic models and, and user behavior. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Charles, for the nice introduction. I'm Dave Bly, and um, I'm going to talk about probabilistic topic models and user behavior. So, um, you know, what are topic models about? Well, I don't need to really say it much anymore, but as more massive collections of electronic texts become available to us, we have new algorithmic needs, right, to organize, visualize, summarize, search, form predictions about, understand, explore um, these large collections of machine-readable documents that we now have at our disposal. And in a nutshell, what topic modeling is about is about discovering the, the thematic structure in large collections of texts. Loosely, it's about, and I'll make this more formal later, annotating the documents according to that structure that we uncovered, and then finally using the annotations to visualize, organize, summarize, do whatever it is we want to do with the documents. So in other words, we want to take that stack of unorganized books and turn it into automatically a nice library without having to read through all the documents, and of course we want to do this with millions of documents. <clears throat> so what are some of the things we can do with topic models? Well, one is to form kind of an exploratory map or summary of the documents in the collection. So here's a picture of a topic model fit to science. In this particular model, there are different, a, a group of, of, of words associated under a single theme is in each of these nodes, like volcanic, deposits, magma, eruption, volcanism. Um, and this is a topic. Okay, we'll define it more formally later. In this particular picture, a connection between topics means that they're likely to co-occur in a document, but the point is, at a high level, we ingest a big collection of documents. The algorithm spits out a map like this, and it gives you a quick summary of what is contained in that collection. OK, we can look at topics through time. So this is another topic model where now the topic, instead of just being a single group of words associated under a theme, is um, a changing sequence of such associations. And this is a particular topic uncovered again from Science Magazine. I'm illustrating it every 10 years. It starts with words like electric, machine, power, engine, steam, and so on. It goes through the decades, tube, apparatus, glass, mercury, um, and then to the present day, device, materials, silicon technology. And what it's done is it's captured, in some sense, the idea that there is scientific apparatus and scientific engineering that goes on in writing science papers, um, and it's a part of these papers. And I, I emphasize again that the input to the algorithm is just the raw text of all the papers. They're not labeled. Nobody, none of the papers are labeled where this is the part where I talk about the apparatus. And this kind of representation of what's in the documents um, comes out of the model. Hey, recently we've been looking at dynamic models of topics to um, find events in large collections of cables. So there's a historian, Matt Connolly at Columbia. He's got two million cables, like telegrams, sent between US embassies in the 1970s. And he wants to, he's a historian. His job is to read two million cables, find the interesting ones. That's it. That's his whole job. And um, <laughs> so we are putting him out of work because we, you know, he wanted us to do that. We uh, ingest the cables, and then we automatically find when significant events occur in this big collection. OK, you can use topic models, as um, Charles mentioned, with, uh, in, in the context of images, too. Here, we're using a topic model to try to annotate images automatically. Um, and adaptations of this idea can be used with other types of data entirely. So this is an example of a mixed membership model, which a topic model is an instance of, um, to, to do overlapping community detection, to take a big social network. In this case, it's 
three and a half million nodes, and to find the overlapping communities that live in that network. If you're all in a network, you might know some people from your neighborhood, some people from work, some people from uh, your childhood, and we want to capture that kind of overlapping community structure in the network. Um, and topic models can also be used, actually they were basically independently invented um, to uh, analyze uh, genetic data. Right? So this is a, just a picture with lots of colors. But it, um, what this represents, each of these little vertical lines is a person. And the, the amount of a, a color within the little vertical line is how much that person reflects some kind of ancestral population. I don't know much about this, but basically there were millions of years ago ancestral populations on Earth, and they wandered around and reproduced, and, but like mixed up, and then now we have us. And they want to um, capture the genetic signature of those ancestral populations automatically just by looking at genes. And that's what this topic model-like thing is doing. Okay. OK, so what's this talk about today? Well, we've been working on topic modeling a long time in my group, but recently realized that people read documents. Okay, these are not just. <laughs> data sets to analyze and write papers about, but they are things that people read. And so here are two examples. Here on the, on the right is a picture uh, common to me, the New York City subway. All right, in the New York City subway, it's like the last place people read. And um, here you see a bunch of people reading on the New York City subway. Um, so these are people that we might want to form predictions about, right? We might want to do recommendation. We, get, we, we know what uh, this fellow is reading on his Kindle, um, and we might want to recommend another book to him, okay? Um, but this is another picture that's relevant. This is Charles Darwin's library. All right? Now, Charles Darwin is not available to recommend books to, but, we might, but knowing what's on his library is also an interesting piece of data in that it tells us about the role that each of these books plays in terms of the history of science. And knowing what was on Charles Darwin's shelf is a signal beyond the text itself about what those books mean. I'm going to try to make that point uh, during this talk. And so um, what I want to talk about is what's called collaborative topic modeling, where we take data like this, what these people are reading and what Charles Darwin is reading, and use it with the text to learn something about both the documents and the people. OK, so in this talk, first I'll give you an introduction to topic modeling. Then I'll talk about this new work on integrating topic modeling and user behavior data, recommendation and exploration with what are called collaborative topic models. And then finally, because uh, uh, this is a data science institute, I want to talk a little bit about the bigger picture, using probability models to solve problems with data, Okay, just for a few minutes at the end. OK, so we'll start with an introduction to topic modeling. So I, I showed you a bunch of elaborate topic models, but I just want to describe now the simplest topic model called latent Dirichlet allocation, which Charles mentioned. Um, the idea behind latent Dirichlet allocation is simple. Documents exhibit multiple topics. Okay, so here's a picture of an article. It's from the journal Science. Calling, it's called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And what this article is about, it's about determining the number of genes that an organism needs to survive in the evolutionary sense. Okay, so over millions of years, will an organism make it? Um, and what I've done by hand on this article is highlighted different words with different colors. Okay, so I highlighted words like genes and genomes and sequenced in yellow. Those are words about genetics. I highlighted words like organism, life, survive, words about evolutionary biology I highlighted in pink, and I highlighted words like computational analysis, numbers, predictions in blue. Okay, they use data analysis to determine this number of genes. Um, and so we can imagine is that if I took the time to highlight all the words in the document, throwing out words like and and of, and then you squinted at that highlighted document, you would see, you know, I don't know what this document's about, but it somehow blends data analysis, evolutionary biology, and genetics. And what latent Dirichlet allocation does is takes this intuition and casts it in a formal probabilistic model of text. Okay, and this is a cartoon of that model. Um, one way to describe statistical models to understand them is to describe the imaginary generative process that they assume the data came from. Okay, and so for a latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA, this is a picture of that generative process. All right, so here's the idea. First, we have a bunch of topics, say 100 topics, 
And each topic, I said it earlier, is just a group of words associated under a theme, but we can define it more formally. It's going to be a distribution over terms in a fixed vocabulary. Okay, so there's a vocabulary, say, of 10,000 terms, and here's a topic with words like gene, DNA, genetic, and so on with high probability. Okay? This topic has life, evolved organism with high probability, and so on. Okay, each of these is just a distribution over the vocabulary. And LDA assumes that each document arises as follows. First, choose a distribution over topics. Okay, that's this little histogram here. Chooses the pink, yellow, and blue topic. Then, for each word in the document, choose a colored button from that distribution. So here I chose the blue button. And then, look up the distribution over terms associated with that button and draw a word. So, choose the word analysis. Here, choose the yellow button, choose the word genetic. Here, I chose the pink button and chose the word life, and so on. I repeat this for every word in the document, um, and that's how I write a document. Then I turn the page of science. I choose a new distribution over topics. Might be genetics, uh, sorry, it might be neuroscience and data analysis, and I choose its words in the same way. A couple of important points. One, the topics stay the same. The, the population of topics stays the same from document to document but how much each document exhibits those topics changes. Okay, that's kind of the hallmark of this type of model. It's called a mixed membership model in statistics. Um, and so if you're a statistician, basically each document's coming from a mixture model where the mixture proportions change from document to document, but the mixture components are fixed across the whole collection. Um, two, notice that this is a model where the word order doesn't matter. Okay, so this with very low probability will come up with coherent sentences and paragraphs and articles worthy of Science Magazine, um, but it will come up with these mixtures of different subject matter. Okay, so that's LDA in a nutshell. That's the generative process that it assumes. Of course, the machine learning statistics algorithmic problem is this. We don't get to observe all that nice structure, right? We just assume that it was there. And what we want to do in inference, posterior inference, is infer all of the values of these hidden variables, right? The topic proportions associated with each article, the colored buttons associated with each word, and the, the topics themselves, the distributions over terms that mixed to form my collection. I have a stack of a million articles. I want to understand what this structure is. OK, so I know most of you are probably familiar with graphical models. In case you're not, this is LDA as a graphical model. What's a graphical model? It's basically a, a graphical description of a probability model where nodes are random variables. Edges denote dependence, or formally possible dependence, but just dependence between random variables. Um, shaded nodes are observed. Unshaded nodes are hidden. And these plates, which these rectangles, represent replication. Okay, so this is the graphical model for LDA, and basically you can read off that generative process I just described for you in this picture. Okay, first I choose, um, I've got 100 topics, say, so K is 100, and I have each topic is a beta, right? So each beta is a distribution over the full vocabulary. For each document, that's the D plate, I choose a distribution over topics, theta D, that's the little cartoon histogram, and then for each word in each document, that's the N plate inside the D plate, I choose a colored button from theta, and then I choose a word from the corresponding distribution over terms. Okay, So this is the same process, and now we've written it down as a graphical model. We like graphical models. You like them, too, because they define a factorization of the joint probability distribution of the ensemble of random variables that's sitting there on the graph. Okay, So this picture defines a factorization of the joint distribution of all of these hidden and observed random variables. Um, it, encodes independence assumptions about the variables through things like de-separation and the Bayes-Ball algorithm. You can, you can answer from this graph which random variables are dependent and conditionally independent. And importantly, it connects to algorithms for computing with data. So the problem that we want to solve of inferring the hidden variables given the observations, that's an inference problem. And this graph helps us write down the algorithms that can solve that problem. Okay, this is why, and graphical models is a beautiful field, good books and papers written about it, um, worth knowing about. OK, so let's try to work with this graphical model. The joint distribution, I mentioned this defines a factorization of the joint distribution of this group of random variables. It defines a posterior, p of theta, z, and beta given w, the probability distribution of all of this hidden structure given the documents themselves. 
And here's the agenda. From a collection of documents, we want to infer the per word topic assignments z, the per document topic proportions theta, and the per corpus topic distributions beta. And then we take posterior expectations of all that stuff, and we use it to do whatever it is we want to do, to do information retrieval, document similarity, build a navigator of our collection, compute predictive perplexity, whatever it is we want to do, we do that with the posterior expectations of all that hidden structure. And so it's in that sense that I meant that you first uncover the structure. That's like calculating the posterior. And then you use that uncovered structure to perform your task using all of these hidden variables that you assumed lived in the corpus and that you discovered through the posterior distribution. And that's the agenda behind a lot of these topic modeling applications. There are many ways to calculate the posterior distribution. Okay, here is a list. <laughs> Half an hour ago, I had coffee with Charles and Akash and learned about another way. <laughs> okay, Three more coffees, and I'm going to have to change the font size. <laughs> We're not going to talk about any of these, but just know that there are a lot of ways to approximate the posterior distribution. You can't compute it exactly. This model is too complicated. Any interesting model you can think of is going to be too complicated to calculate the posterior exactly. But um, there are many ways to approximate it. For this talk, I have a whole other talk all about how to approximate posteriors. But for this talk, let's just pretend, that, or maybe you already know of one, that there is a way that you can run. OK, and we can still have a fun talk, I think, possibly more fun. More importantly, there are lots of ways to do this, but there are also lots of um, open source software packages that have implemented some kind of posterior inference for LDA. So here's a list. Um, I guess I didn't ask Charles if I should add one for his. <laughs> but um, so these are all really good. Each is different. Um, and so if you have a corpus on your hard drive, you can download one of these packages and immediately get started approximating the posterior distribution of LDA. OK, so let's, what would that posterior look like? So, Here's, um, we took the OCR collection of Science Magazine for 10 years. It's a small corpus by today's standard, 17,000 documents. And we fit a 100 topic LDA model using variational inference, which is one of the methods for doing this. Um, so here's that original article, Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And now this is the posterior expectation of theta, the topic proportion. So just to be clear, I ingested 17,000 articles. I asked for 100 topics. We got the posterior. Okay, we got the conditional distribution of all that hidden structure. We take this article and we say, OK, for this article, it's got a theta. What is the posterior expectation of theta? And even though there are 100 topics to play with that the algorithm discovered, only a handful of them have been somehow activated by the particular observed words in this article. And further, if I look, you remember each of these topics is associated um, to a distribution over terms, and I can look at the most frequent terms from the most frequent topics of this article, and they look like this. Okay, human, genome, DNA, genetic, words about genetics, words about evolutionary biology, words about diseases, words about data analysis. Okay, so somehow the topic model is representing this article in terms of its topics, and at least in, for these topics, it seems to make sense to us as it's capturing some kind of meaningful themes in the collection. OK, and now with some of those other algorithms, we can do this at scale. So here are those same kinds of topics. But now these were, were estimated from 2 million articles from the New York Times on a laptop, OK, using some these, are, these algorithms scale up. OK, so you can just download 2 million articles from the New York Times and run an algorithm on your laptop and, and, and understand the topics that live in those 2 million articles. And moreover, understand each article in terms of how it expresses those topics. OK, so I said we're not going to talk about inference. Um, but we can still ask the question, how does this work? Why is it that when I make those assumptions and I feed in 2 million articles, I get these kinds of interpretable distributions over terms back? And I used to think it was just the magic of Bayesian statistics. You just write down the model, and then it has a posterior. And then look, the posterior makes sense. And it's not right. Um, you can, you can think about why the posterior is doing that by examining it just in a room with a piece of paper. Um, and so you know, when you take the posterior, which is proportional to the joint, and you write down the joint, take the log, write down the log joint, you can ask yourself, what configurations of hidden variables will make this large? What 
I have the log joint, which is up to an additive constant equal to the log posterior. What configuration of hidden variables will make this um, quantity big? And when you do that, you'll see that, and I encourage you to do that if you're into this kind of thing, you'll see that LDA trades off two goals in its posterior. First, in each document, it wants to allocate its words to very few topics. Okay, in other words, this sparse representation of the document is no coincidence. It's, it's a byproduct of the nature of the posterior itself. That's the first goal. And the second goal, mirroring what it wants to do for documents, in each topic, it wants to assign high probability to few terms. This has nothing to do with hyperparameters, by the way. This has to do with the likelihood structure of the model. Now, these goals are at odds. If I put a document in a single topic, that makes it hard for that topic to assign high probability to few terms because I have to explain all of the words of that document by that topic. Similarly, mirroring that reasoning, if I put very few words in each topic, that makes number one hard because if I have very few words in each topic, then I'm going to need a lot of topics to somehow cover the um, words of a document. Okay, and so what the LDA posterior does is it trades off these goals to find groups of tightly co-occurring words, and that's, that's why it works. And just for those of you that do probabilistic modeling, I've now started just writing down log joints of all kinds of other models and thinking about them in that way. It's fruitful. Okay, so in summary, LDA discovers themes through posterior inference. We started with that intuition. We ended with a probabilistic modeling problem, and it helps us discover the hidden themes in documents. This really builds on the seminal work of latent semantic analysis from the, from the 80s and early 90s. Um, like I mentioned in statistics, this is called a mixed membership model. And some of those pictures I showed you in the beginning, like of the social network and the genetics, those are mixed membership models applied to other types of data. Um, LDA has close connections to probabilistic PCA and matrix factorization. Um, it's a nice paper by Jacqueline and Buntin about that. Um, and I already mentioned that it was invented for genetics. This is the famous Pritchard, Stevens, and Donnelly paper. OK. so. LDA has become a building block that lets us do a lot of things with text and with documents. Um, here are some pictures of uh, models that build on LDA. And this also kind of shows you the benefits of the graphical model uh, framework in that the algorithms and the graphical models are composable. Right? So you can kind of see LDA as a little submodel in each of these pictures. Um, algorithmic improvements, like the ones I alluded to, let us now fit these models to massive data. And they're implemented in some of these packages, like VW and GenSim and Mallet. Um, and LDA is useful because organizing and finding patterns in text is an important task in a lot of different domains. But really, LDA and topic modeling is just a case study. And I'm going to say this at the end, but in case I don't get there, I wanted to say it now. Not like I'm going to die, but like. Um, <laughs> in case we run out of time. Uh, it's case study in text analysis. I'm very scared now. Uh, it, text analysis with probability models. And um, you know, I like this picture. It's kind of a goofy picture, but it describes the process. We have our knowledge of the world and some kind of question we want to ask about it. And we use our knowledge and the question we want to ask about the world to make assumptions, Okay, like we assume that documents exhibited multiple topics, but that word order didn't matter to find them. Then we take our assumptions, build our little graphical model, and our data, we square them together to uncover patterns. Right? That's inferring the hidden variables given the observations. From the discovered patterns, we now do what we're going to do, form predictions or explore uh, the data or do whatever it is we wanted to do with our task. And so what topic modeling research looks like is developing new models, right? so figuring out new ways, you know, new assumptions to relax or, or m metadata like author and title or citation that we can incorporate into that generative process, um, developing new inference algorithms like I learned about at the coffee shop, um, or developing new applications, visualizations, and tools to use the output of LDA or other hidden variable models um, to use them in useful ways. OK, and so in that spirit, I want to talk now about collaborative topic models. I want to mention this is joint work with Prem Gopalan and Laurent Charlin and Sean Wang. OK, as I mentioned, people read documents. People read on the subway. And Charles Darwin used to read. And 
<laughs> collaborative topic models connect what they are reading to patterns of reading. Okay, and I'll show you the idea. So the running example is going to be scientists sharing their research libraries. Okay, I'm sure many of you have a research library on your hard drive, maybe even a BibTeX file that has like a thousand papers in it. Um, and uh, we can represent that in a matrix like this. Okay, so here users are columns and um, papers are rows. And it's a binary matrix where, you know, here's Charles and Charles only has uh, one paper in his BibTeX, it's the EM paper, okay? And so there Charles has EM, okay? So we have this matrix, big binary matrix for people and what papers they have in their library. And with collaborative topic models, we can do a few things. We can help readers discover documents, old and new, that they like, right? So we might want to know, should I tell Charles to read conditional random fields, given his advisor, <laughs> we hope he's read that paper. But anyway, um, you know, we might want to recommend that to him. Um, and we would do that based on what other people have read conditional random fields, as well as what it's about. But also, you know, let's say we write a paper of topic models for recommendation that nobody, nobody's read yet. We want to know who to recommend that paper to as well, right? And so we might want to recommend that to Charles. And that's called the cold start problem in recommendation systems. It's hard because while Netflix typically uses other people's watching history to recommend you a movie, if a new movie comes out and nobody has seen it yet, then, it's, it's, then Netflix has to somehow rely on the content of that movie or the metadata about that movie to make recommendations. And it's not, you know, I, I, the distinction is there, but it's really a spectrum, right? If a movie comes out and two people have seen it versus two million, then you might want to rely more on the content than those two people's other preferences. And there's kind of this smooth spectrum that you can imagine with um, cold start and with recommendation. So recommendation, telling people what to read on the subway is one application. Another application is to describe readers in terms of topical preferences. So collaborative topic models are going to, as you can imagine, use the topics of these documents to help us form recommendations. And in doing that, we're going to represent people in terms of topics. Okay, so um, we will represent that Charles is interested in machine learning and statistics and natural language processing um, in, these in, in these interpretable topics. And then finally, I'm kind of most interested in this, collaborative topic models help us identify documents that are impactful and interdisciplinary. Okay, so we can ingest a big collection of articles, we can analyze it in this model I'm going to show you, and from that we can say, oh, this is a paper that is interesting to people who aren't interested in the topics that this paper is describing. Okay, and that's kind of a new thing that we can do with this model. Okay, so um, to describe this, I want to give you a cartoon. So um, how many of you have read the EM paper? Okay, how many of you know the EM algorithm? Okay, good. So you can see the EM algorithm has had a big impact. Um, and let's imagine it's 1977. The EM paper came out in 1977. It's a dusty statistics paper, um, dry. It's written by some amazing statisticians. And um, in 1977, when the EM paper comes out, let's imagine there's just two things in the world, computer vision and statistics. Okay, so there's two things, and the EM paper just came out. We're going to look at that EM paper, and we're going to say, okay, it's 1977. I don't know anything about EM. It's about statistics. I looked at the words, and I see this is about statistics. Okay, there's two things in the world, so there's only two types of people, too. Statisticians and vision researchers. Okay, statisticians are interested in statistics. Vision researchers are interested in vision. It's 1977. You would recommend the EM paper to the statisticians. Here's a paper. It's about statistics. Hey, statisticians, go read this paper. But fast forward to this room where you've all heard of the EM paper. And we now, I should ask, how many of you have the EM paper in your BibTeX file? OK, <laughs> somewhere in between. Um, with the user data, we, we now know who's reading the EM paper, right? We have, we have users and papers. And from that data, we should be able to detect, you know, it's not just statisticians reading the EM paper, it's computer vision researchers as well. All right, and so what we're going to do is we're going to represent the EM paper both as a st statistics paper, but also as a computer vision paper thanks to this user behavior data. Intuitively, we should be able to do that. And now you consider the scientists again, and you recommend the EM paper to the computer vision researchers. Okay, so the point is, without the text, 
we wouldn't be able to recommend the EM paper to anyone. Nobody read the EM paper when it first came out in 1977, so we wouldn't know who to hand it to. But without the user data, we would never be able to recommend it to computer vision researchers because no number of years is going to change, I don't know where it was in the annals of statistics, this dry, dusty 1977 paper about maximum likelihood. It's always going to be about statistics. Okay, and so only with the user behavior data can we understand that the EM paper has had an impact beyond statistics and that computer vision researchers are reading it. Okay, so let me show you how we did that with probability model. Okay, so here's the probability model. And you can see on the left, we have LDA. So I'll, exp I'll explain it. On the left, we have LDA. Okay, so we have a D plate. That's, those are documents. And the kind of left column of random variables is LDA, as I just described. Topic proportions, topic assignments, and words. Okay, and topics. Then we have this other plate, U. Okay, U is, is users. And U, there's VUD and XU. VUD is, represents vote. It's whether or not you, user U has document D in her library. Okay, that's VUD, binary variable say. But it could be a rating, it could be anything. Um, and then XU is the preferences of user U. Okay, XU is what user U likes. Okay, so now notice, let's take a look at the edges. Um, VUD depends on XU and theta D. I'll get to zeta D in a second. VUD depends on XU and theta D. Theta D are the topics of the article. XU is, are the user preferences. And basically, VUD is going to be drawn from some distribution that relates to their inner product or their distance. OK, so it says if the EM paper is about statistics and user U is interested in statistics, then, then user U has a high probability of having the EM article in their library. Zeta D, we never came up with a good word for it, so it's called the correction, um, is the idea behind Zeta D is that it corrects what um, Theta D can't capture. So Theta D are those black, let me see if I have it, oh, I don't have it here. So Theta D is that black representation of EM as being only about statistics. Zeta D is that red spike at computer vision. It's a free variable, and it lets us represent document in ways that theta D doesn't represent the documents because can't, it doesn't, th those topics don't describe the words, um, but that do describe the votes. Okay, so kind of the critical piece here is that VUD depends on theta D, but theta D also describes the words. Zeta D depends only on V, VUD only depends, the, Zeta D only influences VUD. And so whatever theta D can't explain in the data, Zeta D picks up. Okay, those are those red spikes. Okay, and in particular, so, so VUD comes from a Poisson whose distribution is an inner product of theta D plus zeta D, okay? Statistics plus whatever this free variable is. And so operationally, again, we got to think about the posterior. In the posterior, when I condition on the words, I get topics. When I condition on the votes, I say, okay, you know, here's the EM paper, okay? And, and, and I'm conditioning on the votes or the clicks or whatever you want to call them. Um, first, I can, I can identify that people who are interested in statistics, which EM is about, are also interested in the EM paper. But then there's a bunch of other people that are reading the EM paper, and they're not interested in statistics. So I make up for that with zeta d. Okay? One question that I get asked a lot is, how do you tell the difference between not being interested in statistics and being interested in statistics? Okay? It sounds like a joke with a punchline. It's not. Um, I couldn't even dream of a punchline for that joke. Um, but but the, the answer is this. Let's say, I have, let's say I'm a computer vision researcher. I have no interest in statistics, but I have the EM paper in my, um, in my uh, library. Well, to say that I'm a little bit interested in statistics to explain that vote would mean that I have other statistics papers in my library. But I don't. I only have the EM paper. And so the model likes better to explain that by, by increasing uh, the computer vision component of zeta. OK, hopefully this will be clear with some examples. But this is the idea. All right, this is the model that captures that. Any questions about this before I continue? Is it clear? OK, one person nodded. By the way, we use these Poissons and gammas everywhere. I'm not going to talk about it here, but this is a cool way to do um, 
to model user behavior data. It's super efficient and only looks at the non-zero entries and things like that. And I recommend looking into it. You can look into these papers for inf information about that. Um, OK, let me just show you what this does. So we have a big data set from Mendeley. Um, 261,000 documents, 80,000 users. Mendeley is like a company that they got bought by Elsevier, but they, they, um, they gather BibTeX files from scientists. Right? They just collect BibTeX files from scientists, and then they, you know, they have a, they, scientists can share their BibTeX files with each other through Mendeley. Um, and so we have a big data set from them with uh, 260,000 documents, 80,000 people, and um, we fit one of these models to Mendeley. Okay, so here's the EM paper. So now you'll believe me that it's a dry, dusty statistics paper. It's a great paper, but um, a broadly applicable algorithm for computing maximum likelihood estimates, blah, blah, blah. You would never guess that it's going to have like a major impact on every single field in engineering. And here's what the EM paper is about. So you fit this model, and this is the topical representation of the EM paper. And as for the other paper, you can see that a handful of topics, there are 500 topics here, a handful of topics are activated. Um, and the most active ones are about algorithms and about probability models. And that pretty much sums up the EM paper. It's an algorithm for finding maximum likelihood estimates in the face of hidden variables. Now what I'm going to do. So that's theta, right? That describes the words of the EM paper. And to some degree, it describes some of the votes, some of the people clicking on the EM paper. Um, but now I'm going to add zeta, the correction var variable for the EM paper. And you're going to see that the EM paper has a different characterization when it comes time to explain the clicks. OK, so you know, first of all, everything kind of pops up a little bit because it's so popular. That's an artifact of the model. Um, but more interesting, and also it's a very important paper within algorithms, right? So you see this algorithm topic is right here, and when I go to the next one, it spikes up, okay? But more interesting is what pops out of the weeds, right? So here, what pops out of the weeds is, um, you know, here's computer vision, image, object, matching, tracking, motion, segmentation, and here's network analysis. The EM paper is also important for, for community detection. Um, and these, of course, the original paper has nothing to do with community detection or um, computer vision, but we can now express that representation. We, sorry, we can now express those aspects of the EM paper through the user behavior data coupled with the text. Okay, with just user behavior data, you couldn't see this. You wouldn't tell the difference between when somebody's interest in a paper aligns with what the paper is about. But without the user behavior data, the EM paper would only look like this. Okay? Um, You've been to many computer science talks. This is what you would expect. <laughs> More interesting to me is that the readers also tell us about the articles. OK, so that little fact about the EM paper that we see that it, that it you know, we ask this question, OK, well, we got better recommendation. But now it's cool that we could see that the EM paper is about computer vision just from the user data coupled with the text. Can we, rather than analyze users, analyze documents in, in a way that kind of brings that out? And so what I want to show you is how we can use posterior estimates to find interdisciplinary articles, influential articles in a field, and outside influences on a field. OK, this is all correlation. None of this is you know, proven. But it's a nice new way to explore a document collection if you have user behavior data. OK, so one of the topics is about network analysis, statistical network analysis, network connected modules, nodes, links, topology, and so on. And this is about statistical methods for analyzing networks to do things like community detection. So with topic models, with the first half of the talk, we can do things like ask which articles are about that topic. OK, and that's how you could build a browser of the documents. Right? And what you do then is, um, let's see if you can see that, you filter by networks. You take all the articles, and they each have a theta associated with them. And you say, OK, this, this topic is about networks. Let me sort the articles in order of how much they express that topic. All right? And when you do that, you get this. These are like some of the top 10 articles. Assortative mixing in networks, mixing patterns in networks, catastrophic cascades of failures in interdependent networks. These are all articles that are about network analysis. They're good. I mean, the first two I've read, and they're excellent. Um, and uh, that's what you can do with LDA. <clears throat> now, with this model, we can ask the question, OK, I want to look at papers about networks, but I want to organize them by 
how likely somebody who's interested in networks is going to, I'll just say, click, click on them, okay, or read them. And you get a different list, okay? So what I'm doing now is I'm still filtering by papers that have a high proportion of the network topic, but now I'm adding that correction vector to them, and I'm asking within this topic, which papers have a high theta plus zeta? Clear? And, and these are papers about networks for readers of networks. And what you see here are a different set of papers. Okay, and so these are kind of, these papers happen to be more highly cited and they, they appeared in Science and Nature and you can kind of imagine that they would be in more people's bib tech libraries at least, okay? Even more interesting, I think, is that we can ask this kind of weird converse question. Well, I can filter by networks. I can just take a collection of papers that are at least, whatever, 25% networks. But then I can order those papers by the sum of their corrections in all the other topics. In other words, I'm gonna factor out, I don't care who, which papers are interesting to network readers, I want papers that are interesting to readers of other topics. And you get yet a different list, right? Here you see things like mapping the structural core of human cerebral cortex, network thinking and ecology and evolution, and linked the new science and networks. And these first two are kind of classical interdisciplinary papers, right? I took network analysis and I applied it to another discipline. So it was very interesting, and they happened to be good papers, and it was interesting to people in that discipline. The last one is like a popular science book about networks, right? And so that is not only interested, interesting to readers of networks, but interesting um, to broad readership. And we could probably divide up these two signals in, in other ways as well. Okay, so this is kind of capturing interdisciplinary papers. Again, you wouldn't be able to find this with just a topic model or just a collaborative filtering model. All right, and we can ask the reverse, which is, okay, now rather than filtering on papers about networks, I wanna take the, co the complement to that, all the other papers, papers that are not about networks, and ask which papers that are not about networks do people normally, who are normally interested in networks like to read? All right, and, and we get papers about, actually this was sort of unpleasant because these are authors who usually write about networks, but then happen to not write about them in these papers. So it kind of captured the insular network analysis community. But um, <laughs> the idea, this is just the data, the idea is that these are papers that are not necessarily about network analysis, they're about kind of heavy tail distributions and burstiness and things like that, and the network folks like to read them, okay? And we can do this with each topic, right? That was just one topic. So for the statistical modeling topic, we find people that read statistical modeling um, want to read papers like a Bayesian analysis of some nonparametric problems. That's the classical Dirichlet process paper from 1972 or three. Bayesian measures of model complexity and fit. That's the, I think it's um, Spiegelhalter, I can't remember, classical paper about um, model selection and Monte Carlo methods in Bayesian computation, book about MCMC. All right, these are, the, these are papers about statistical modeling for readers of statistical modeling. Now, let's look at the list of papers about statistical modeling for people who like other things. And you see the famous Robiner tutorial on HMMs. You see the Heckerman tutorial on Bayesian networks. And you see the EM paper as popping up as one of these interdisciplinary papers. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through this quickly because I wanna show you some other stuff. Um, but, you know, Mendeley is like a carefully, well, not that carefully, but sort of carefully curated collection of data in that you need to put a paper in your BibTeX file in order to, um, to, to have it as, as part of the Mendeley data set. We also apply this algorithm to clicks on the archive. Okay, so we have 10 years of clicks on the archive. This is 825,000 documents, 120,000 users. They have some algorithm for figuring out users. Um, and the point here is that, you know, Mendeley is careful. You might wake up at two in the morning and you can't sleep, so you go see what's on the archive and you start clicking around. <laughs> and that's this data. Okay, so this is, this is just average Joe and Jane clicking on the archive because they can't sleep type of stuff. Um, again, same results. And again, we can ask these interesting questions now just based on clicks, right? Based on clicks, we can ask what are people who read StatML reading? What are other people reading that are in StatML? Um, and what are in, and, and so on. And, and here, 
there's a lot of confounding in that the archive is so physics-based that the physicists are kind of dominating this, um, this data set. Um, but the point is we can do this with clicks as well. And we've done it with, with people reading popular books and so on. And, and um, it gives you this other characterization of readership. OK. Um, <clears throat> last example. I didn't do this, um, but I found out about it. So there's this library in New York, the New York Society Library. It was the first library in New York. This is a picture of the old building, but it's now in a different building. Um, but it started in 1754. And graduate student Mark Hoffman and Peter Behrman, who's a sociologist at Columbia, they are using this model. So we have the, so the source code release. They are using this model to explore usage patterns of important figures in US history. Okay, so basically, you know, I said, OK, we're not interested in readers. We're interested in papers, because that's what was interesting there. But they are also interested in the readers, because they have data of people checking out books between 1789 and 1806. And these are famous people, like, Alexander, like John Jay, Aaron Burr, et cetera. And um, they're checking out books like The Prince. And, um, and these are sociologists and historians, and so they're interested in characterizing various aspects of people's reading behavior in the, um, you know, in 1789. So I asked, I asked Mark, I said, what interesting stuff did you find? And, you know, he sent me this plot where, um, you know, so here is, so now it's also interesting to look at the reading preferences of famous people from American history. This is back when, you know, Republicans checked out books. And so, <laughs> so you know, I don't know much about American history, but the Republicans and the Federalists, the, the, the Federalists wanted closer connections to, to Europe and to England. The Republicans wanted more of a separation. And they apparently had different reading behaviors, too. So, you know, the Republicans read about the French Revolution and English Parliament and had more secular reading behaviors. The Federalists had more classical reading behaviors. And this, again, this is according to Mark Hoffman. So if you're a historian or if you are, know more about this than I do, I'm probably going to say something mistaken. But anyway, the point is, Mark told me that, that when you analyze the data, this pops out, that, that the Federalists have these more classical reading behaviors and the Republicans have more secular reading behaviors. And he did something even more rigorous in this kind of trying to classify the, the different types of people using their reader preferences via collaborative topic models and found good classification accuracy and so on. Anyway, so I wanted to bring this up as an example of learning about readers like Charles Darwin, in this case Aaron Burr and John Jay, um, from this kind of user behavior data. Uh, okay, good. So that's collaborative topic models. We connect text to usage. Um, it blends content-based recommendation with user-based recommendation, and it opens windows into characterizing how people read. Um, and although I didn't talk about it, it captures that spectrum that I mentioned, that there is kind of the cold start spectrum where the model via the posterior distribution naturally relies more on the content. And then there's the spectrum where many, many people have read the paper, and so the model relies more on user behavior to form recommendations. And this, you know, for the papers that are hardly ever read, this relies more, this, this will rely more on the content, and then as they are read more and more, it will rely more on the users. Okay, so finally, I wanted to just chat a little bit about modern probabilistic modeling. Okay. So traditional machine learning and statistics, how do you use it to solve modern problems? Well, what you do is you take a cookbook of methods, a shoehorn, and duct tape, okay? And you basically link your neural net to a logistic regression, to a soft max, whatever. You duct tape it all together, throw in other things, and get something that works, okay? Probabilistic machine learning is more about tailoring models for the problem at hand. You have a problem, you have knowledge about it, and you want to kind of build one method that is tailored to that, to that problem you want to solve. Why is probabilistic machine learning exciting? Well, you can compose and connect reusable parts. Kind of saw that with LDA and then uh, collaborative topic models. It's driven by disciplinary knowledge and its questions. In other words, you can encode in these graphical models 
what you know about the world and or what theories you have about the world that you want to impose on your data analysis. Um, it focuses on discovering and using structure and unstructured data, as we saw here. Um, and it, unlike methods that focus on prediction, it often focuses, in addition to prediction, on things like exploratory, interpretable, observational, and causal analysis. All right, there's a downside. The cookbook shoehorn duct tape method um, is fast and scalable, and there are many packages and libraries available, and you can, you can accomplish quite a bit with this, proceed, with this approach to doing data analysis. Um, probabilistic machine learning tends to be more challenging to implement. It may not be as fast and scalable, although that's something that we in probabilistic machine learning are working on. So the big picture that I kind of have in my head is that you know, there's statistics, machine learning, and data science. They're all the same. Inside that, there's probabilistic modeling. And topic modeling is one piece of this larger world of probabilistic modeling. Okay? I used to put that in the center, but it gave the wrong impression. <laughs> this is not to scale, but I do want to point out that you know, we, deep learning and reinforcement learning are very important parts of this whole world, too. And there's a really inter interesting and beautiful intersection between probabilistic machine learning and deep learning and, and reinforcement learning. It's worth studying. OK, so what is probabilistic machine learning? We talked, we talked about topic modeling, but what is that bigger set? Well, kind of go through this process. First, you assume your data comes from a model that uses hidden patterns to describe the data. Then you discover those patterns from the data. And this is the objective function for variational inference, for example. Um, and then you use those discovered patterns to do something, to, to explore the data, form a prediction, in, build an information retrieval system, and so on. And so this is that picture I showed you before. I like this picture because customizing data analysis is important in a lot of fields, sociology, history, economics, physics, genetics, and so on. And this, I collaborate a lot with scientists like that, and this pipeline separates these key activities of making assumptions about the world, computing under those assumptions, and then applying the results of that computation. And so this facilitates, I know this is a data science institute, this facilitates kind of interdisciplinary collaborative data science problem solving in that you know, neuroscientists can knock on my door, and um, you know, even someone who doesn't know a lot about probability models who's a scientist can draw circles and arrows on my whiteboard, right? And, and, and get it, you know, kind of figure out that, that sort of draw graphically the kinds of hidden patterns that they're imagining live in their data and how they interact to form the observed data. Then they leave, and um, my students and postdocs and I can work on the algorithm, given what's on the whiteboard, take a picture of it first. We, uh, given what's on the whiteboard, we can write an algorithm down that that infers what's in the hidden variables given the observations. That takes, we're working on that, but that takes you know, between three months to a number of years. And then we call back the scientists and say, hey, we analyzed the data. Now you know, here's the hidden variables and so on. OK? And, and, and I like separating those activities. Now, it also speaks to what we might need in probabilistic machine learning. We need flexible and expressive components for building models. right? We want to build out the kind of tinker toy uh, box of probability models so that we can compose more interesting models. And, and that's also where that intersection between deep learning and probabilistic machine learning uh, lives. Like, uh, if one of those models is draw Z from a normal and then put Z through a neural network and then spit out the, uh, uh, an observation or a random variable whose parameter is a function of the output of that neural network, then that's an, a, a very flexible and expressive building block in the context of Bayesian machine learning. Um, so we need that. We need scalable and generic inference algorithms. Okay, my other talk, I have two talks. I'm only giving one. Uh, <laughs> my other talk is about that. How do I take this piece, and it doesn't take three years for us to develop an algorithm, but rather just from a, a program that describes the model, we can maybe compile that program down into an executable. This is probabilistic programming. That takes as input data and spits out um, these kinds of patterns. Right, And so, so we want to make that generic in that sense, and scalable in that we can also do this with massive data sets. Okay, MCMC, it scales to some degree, but it doesn't scale as much as kind of high-octane optimization could scale. 
Um, and then finally, we need easy to use software to stretch probabilistic modeling to new areas. And also, I should add here, um, to stretch probabilistic modeling to new areas, to talk to historians and solve problems about secret cables in the 1970s. Okay, and, and when we have that, when we've lubricated this pipeline, then it reveals that this is really kind of a loop, right? What we want to do is not, you know, this is what happens now, and, and it takes so long to do inference that you have to write a paper after you've done this. But what you want is, is to go through this loop, right? This is serious. Like, you want to make assumptions, uncover patterns, look at your data under those patterns, and then realize, oh, you know, there's something wrong, and I'm not capturing some kind of spatial correlation, for example, so I want, and I, and I find that through model criticism. This is a little figure I copied from a beautiful paper from 1980 by George Box and, um, about model checking. And, um, and then you revise your model and, and proceed. But of course, we can't do this if we don't have easy ways to do inference with many, many models. Okay, and we, we're working on that now. This is a library that we're working on called Edward, which does probabilistic modeling, inference, and criticism. It's, it, this picture makes it look really easy. Edward is not as easy as that yet, but it's getting there. And, um, and if you're interested in this stuff, I encourage you to check out Edward. OK, so that's what I talked about. And um, thanks very much. I like this quote. <clears throat> And it's time for questions, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have some uh, time for questions. Thank you, David. Um, you gave us examples where you've got an interdisciplinary field and you find that there's crossover. One thing indirectly you talked about was the same thing being discovered in multiple fields, multiple separate fields. And it eventually people discover that the same thing. But I'm wondering whether this speeds up, could speed that up when the fields talk about things in different ways and they're different people because they're narrow. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that's important. So I so. That would be a next step here. This, I don't think this gets us all the way there, because in order to understand that the EM paper is important to computer vision, we need a bunch of computer vision people to already have discovered the EM. Actually, EM is a great example of that. It was discovered and rediscovered multiple times in the 40s and in the 50s. Um, in the context of the HMM, it was discovered. In the context of the Kalman filter, it was discovered. In the context of genetics, it was discovered. And then that paper is really the one that kind of unified it. Um, one, something that I'm interested in, in thinking about that I have not done anything about is that, you know, one of the blocks to that is mathematics, right? Like, a, an economist might use different notation from a physicist, from a statistician, and, um, but they're all writing about the same thing. And, and the math might be one place where you could imagine, and I mean, the vocabularies are different, where you can, where you could connect, you could say, hey, there's something to this and this. Um, but yeah, that's, that would be a, a great next phase for this kind of research. All right. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, it, it seems like one of the assumptions that's underlying uh, this approach, which allows it to work, is a kind of sparsity sort of assumption. And I'm wondering, so what happens when that breaks down? For example, like if you look at human behavior, well, everybody breathes, so there's like connection, you know, your graph is fully connected. Or, or if there's some outlier, like if you're looking at uh, reading, well, everybody's read Harry Potter or one of them, something like that. So what happens in cases like this? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I th well, I think that that falls into the kind of criticized model piece here, that you would want to discover those kinds of deviations from your modeling assumptions. Um, and this would not capture those kinds of things. It would do something, but it would probably have to learn that Harry Potter is interesting to everybody, rather than learn that Harry Potter is interesting to most of them, and so therefore it's probably interesting to everybody. Um, that would be a more complicated model. Um, so it, it would break down in that setting. And you know where you see that is in topic modeling itself. So I, I mentioned just uh, off the cuff that we remove words like as and of and the stop words. And if you leave the stop words in, then they rise to the top of every topic because they, they violate the assumptions that we're making. And in order to explain all those stop words, um, you 
just give them high probability on their every topic, right? But that kind of defeats the purpose if we're looking for something interpretable. Um, there, is, there was work on, um, I can't remember the papers, the David Mimno and others wrote the paper where they fit the prior distribution on the topic proportions. And when you do that, you learn a stop word topic. So that's one way to do it, for instance. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, this is assuming sparsity. And when we throw out the stop words, we're creating sparsity. Um, thank you for the great talk. And I wanted to ask you, you, you keep mentioning that uh, when you have a paper in vision that nobody has read, then you have to wait for people to read it to then do this, this inference. But ha have you thought about using like some kind of cosine similarity to find similar papers to that one and then use those as context? So for an unread paper, then look similar ones. Right, so that, that's effectively happening through the topic model. So that is what okay. happens. So if you write a computer vision paper, it's gonna, the, this model will say, okay, the paper's about computer vision, so I'm gonna recommend it to the people interested in computer vision. And how does it know it's about computer vision? There's no exact other paper like that. It's essentially an alternative way of doing similarity. It's finding that it's similar to other papers about computer vision. Um, actually, it's finding something a little more perhaps interesting because it's, it's finding maybe it's a paper about computer vision and neuroscience, and so it'll actually recommend to, eat to, to each group of people. Um, but what you asked suggests that you might be able to use other kinds of metadata to try to learn a pattern of these corrections, right? So maybe we learn that, you know, um, papers about this aspect of computer vision are interesting to people interested in neuroscience, even though they're not about neuroscience. And this will not do that, right? This requires each individual paper about vision that's interesting in the neuroscientist be read by the neuroscientist first. Okay. But we could pop up a level and say, okay, what about this paper could be used to predict that zeta? We haven't tried that. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Great, any other questions? Uh, so if I understood correctly for these, using these LDA for topic modeling, let's say if you were going to do it for all the articles in science, uh, a priori you have to first pick, uh, make a choice about how many topics you're going to allow for. Yeah. So what dictates that choice of how many topics? Is it primarily efficiency considerations for being able to actually perform the analysis or is it you, somehow you have to, you know, figure out roughly how many topics there ought to be. And so I, I, don't, I have no idea how that choice is made. That yeah, means. that's a good question. So um, there are many answers. And um, the, if there's a task you care about downstream, then usually some kind of cross-validation against some measure of success in that task would be one way to do it. Um, if there's no task you care about downstream, then sometimes cross-validation on something like predictive log likelihood, right? So this is classical model, it's a model selection problem that you bring up. Um, there's also Bayesian nonparametrics, uh, 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 Sharon's an expert in this, um, which is a um, way of letting the data determine the number of topics. So basically the number of topics becomes part of the whole model um, in, a, in an interesting way in that not only does the data determine the number of topics in the posterior, but a new document you know, that's so innovative that it's not about any of these topics can be attached to a new topic. You know, Bayesian nonparametrics is interesting, is, is great, and in the, the Bayesian nonparametric version of LDA is called the hierarchical Dirichlet process, but it really um, shines, I think, when you have a more complicated topic structure. So imagine you elaborate LDA so that topics, it's not just a flat a number of K topics, but it's a hierarchy of topics. And now you have to choose among trees, all right? So cross-validation isn't your friend here. You can't possibly enumerate all the trees and use cross-validation. And Bayesian nonparametric approaches to that then implicitly search over the trees as part of the inference problem. Now, this is getting you somewhere. It's not, you still have to understand the properties. Uh, you know, it's, it's still hard to understand the properties of those, of those techniques. And those techniques come with choices you have to make. There's kind of no way out. But, um, but those are some of the approaches that people take. Okay, let's, um, um, so, oh, before I say that, um, so just to remind you, there will be a reception on the ground floor of the informatics forum, and um, let's thank Dave again. Thanks, Tom.